wanted us to be able to come together today to be able to talk about uh, what is going on in Ukraine and to be able to provide a space and a, uh, a setting for us to be able to discuss some of the deeper, deeper motivations that are going on behind the scenes on this. Um, but before I do it, I just want to check in with everybody to see how everyone's doing. Okay. So I'll just just pop in here just to say hello to Dave and Paul and Floyd and, and Rob and John and Deb and Edwina. Um, I'm suffering just, re well, I don't know, suffering maybe um, my own sign of insanity, but I just am finishing COVID. So I will be here um, when they talk about the um, COVID brain. It's true. It happens. Um, if I'm like looking off into the left field, COVID brain <laughs> and, and COVID brain and CB, Chuck Blocker, they go together. So um, I'm trying to throw in a little humor because tonight what we're going to be talking about is going to be um, difficult and also just, um, let's face it, it's hard. You know, we're a part of it. They're a part of us. We're part of the world, and um, this is a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And so with that, anybody else want to join us, want to just jump in, say how they're doing? Well, my name is John Reed, and I, I feel like a bit of an outsider. I'm looking around and not seeing any familiar faces. Uh, I got connected with this group when my very, very dear friend, Ed Tick, was given a presentation, and and so I kind of felt a, a connectivity ever since then. And uh, I have been thinking and uh, writing and praying a lot yeah. in Ukraine and Russia. And so I thought, wow, uh, I would love to hear the perceptions and the, and the takes of people who've been in war mm -hmm. to this particular or so I hope I hope you'll tolerate me as an outsider. I've never been a soldier. Not with a gun. Mm. Thank you, John, for joining yeah. us. And you're and you're welcome. You're welcome here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, and it's uh <clears throat> You know, what we're looking at um, with Ukraine is uh, the horrors that we haven't seen on this in over 80 years uh, on this planet. You know, uh, seeing uh, a country, a, a sovereign country being invaded by a power that um, has grandiose ideas linked to a past that needs to remain in the past. And to watch and see the travesty unfold. To think that this was, a, this was a connected to a past that was long ago dealt with and that there was a sense of after World War II that we would never see this again. We would never watch this happen again where millions over 3.5 million refugees have fled Ukraine and, and growing. Uh, the bombings of cities and hospitals and um, people being indiscriminately bombed and uh, villages destroyed, people being taken away, uh, the horrors of war uh, unleashed uh, against uh, people that wanna be free people that want to have their own self-determination, their own government, their own way of living. And um, we are witnessing uh, a group that, uh, a country that wants to, to go back to a time um, that they consider to be their golden time, that they consider to be their time when they were recognized as a uh, legitimate, superpower 
and that they are done in spite of the horrors that are unfolding that we bear witness to. They are willing to uh, throw that all that out the window uh, in order to regain geopolitical dominance, or at least maintain re or reclaim what they feel that they have lost. And we're going to be talking here in a little bit about uh, Alexander Dugan. Uh, he is a political theorist, philosopher, and uh, one of the, uh, in my research as I was preparing for this lecture, uh, one, of the, one of the people behind this that has been, they've been laying the tracks for this for at least 20 years. Um, and, you know, I, I, I want us to be able to understand some of these deeper dimensions that are occurring that are being instigated by certain individuals who have a vision of the world that's very different from ours. That's very different from the one where we're connected to the sense of, uh, of freedom and human rights and the dignity of the individual. But there's a whole other world of vision out there that is in, 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 is anathema to this. They're against this vision. They stand opposed to it. So what we are witnessing is a clash of civilizations. It's a class of opposing worldviews. And you know, before I get started on this, I just want to honor uh, everyone who came on here tonight to listen to this. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is difficult material, and we will get to be able after the the lecture part of it, I do want to make sure we open it up and, and to, to allow everyone to share their impressions, their feelings, their um, fears or anxieties, their, uh, you know, as, as veterans and warriors, we see this and I, and I certainly have my take on this as a, as a, as a, as a veteran and uh, having wanting to, 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 to serve my country, to live up to fighting for our freedoms and our, and our way of life and, and witnessing and seeing people willing to die for that. I, I understood that at a very core level. And so I'm, I, I certainly have my take and I will, I will share that towards the end here. But I really wanted to start this off with just um, really trying to get to understanding why. Why Russia would attack a sovereign nation that was living in peace and not threatening anyone, um, whose people had chosen to be a part of the West, which is a democratically elected government, the right to self-determination, the freedom for all, universal human rights, and equal justice under the law. That is what we at our core, that's what we stand for. But I wanna introduce you to someone right now. His name is Alexander Dugan. And he is a man who's considered by many to be Putin's brain. Oh, everything is relative and we need we in russia we could use postmodernity in order to explain to the west that if any truth is re re uh, relative so we have our special russian truth that you need to accept as something that maybe is not your truth even if it's not true but if the truth is relative, it, uh, that doesn't mean that the truth doesn't exist. Yeah. That means that absolute truth, one for all, uh, doesn't exist. Let's take an example. If you, if you watch Russian television today, um, you'd think that uh, Russia and America were about to go to war. Yes, but the same if we are if we are examining, examining if we are reading American press, yeah. we have the same impression. Not really. I've just come back from America. You don't really get that impression. Do Do you think this is genuinely the case? No, I, I think that now uh, the, the situation is 
in Syria, for example, United States continuing to be unipolar or consider continuing to consider itself as unipolar uh, power, uh, it says no more Assad. And athleticists, uh, powers of the Western uh, um, Europe re repeats after Washington. We uh, doesn't want any more Assad, but Putin, other civilization says stop. Let have Assad. And after that, there are, there is our nuclear and uh, military power beside, uh, behind Assad. So, and that is serious. If you are boss, you could not let the other decide, if you really is uh, a boss, decide what to do in your realm of responsibility. It is conflict. Mm -hmm. And Russia says, no, you are not boss. You are not anymore boss. That's very serious. It mm -hmm. is if, if we, we insist on multipolarity and if behind us there is nuclear weapon and the iron will to defend, for example, in the little case of Assad, defend Assad. Assad is principally not because we have so much interest there. That is the question of who rules the world. But that but is the problem. But what so that is that's possible war. Only war could re decide really what do, uh, who do, is the boss. Do you think that's really a possibility? If United States doesn't want to, to to start a war, you should recognize United States should recognize openly for all humanity, all mankind, that the United States is not anymore unique master. So let recognize that uh, there will be no war but we understand uh, our position is that we are going to fight up to the end in order to show to any to everybody that united states is not any more unique master it's very serious very serious because we are seriously going to to show and to confirm that we are entering in a multipolar world mm -hmm. and the, the situation in Syria on Ukraine and uh, 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 anywhere else uh, that's only the case to prove that we don't want that but we understand that if we will be not ready to pay all the price for that we could not gain. Mm. So, so Ukraine and Syria are all about proving to America yes. that they're not the boss. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That they are not unique boss. So may I ask you a personal question? When you watch the news on Russian television, do you believe what you see? Absolutely. Because... Really? You're an intelligent man. Our, Surely uh, you can't yes, believe because some of the most outlandish things. Uh, no, no, no. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Postmodernist uh, postmodernism um, teaches us to understand oh, our sociology. I am sociolog as well, and what is total fact uh, according to Durkheim? Total fact, total fact. The, the founder of sociology, Emil Durkheim, 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 affirmed that total fact it is the fact the society believes in. So if enough people believe it, it'll become true? No, no. The truth is the question of belief. And postmodernity shows that every so-called truth is the matter of believing. So we believe in what we do, we believe in uh, what we say, and that is the only way to define the truth. The truth is the matter of belief. And that is not only our position, because when I see Western media, I ask myself how the people could lie in such way. They lie about everything in the world. But after that, I, I say to myself, stop. That is not lie. It is their truth. But wait, I work they are completely <laughs> convinced that they are true. I work in the Western media. I'm a reporter. I go out on the ground. 
I report what I see. Nobody, nobody no. tells me from on no, high. No, no, no. The there is no such thing. The fact it's it's on al always interpretation. There is no such things as a fact. Wittgenstein has proven that. Mm -hmm. There is no fact. There's only interpretation. You see because you interpret this or so or so. Our manner of thinking of any man, of any culture, of any civilization it deals only with interpretation. You cannot see nothing without interpretation. You, what you I, see, it's interpretation. I, I see you. I, I see you can argue that philosophically, but uh, it if, is not if somebody, it's if somebody, if somebody, if somebody flies an airplane and drops a bomb on a building in Aleppo, somebody sorry, that airplane. Sorry. Somebody has dropped that bomb. Who, who has fixed that? Whose airplane? Airplane is it? What is the bomb? What is the quarter the bomb is falling on? What are the people? Yeah. And there begins our interpretation because but, it is the it's war. But it's it is very really difficult to, to go in it to see and to prove for you any bomb falling is Russian bomb. Uh, any uh, killed by Russian bomb should be an innocent civilian and any harm that is done in the Aleppo or in the Syria is absolutely from the beginning you have no idea that could be different because you are real normal Western men, Western reporter, Western journalist. It is your truth to see, to say, to presume, to be completely convinced the Russian are evil. So that are they won the battle on the I, I, I've spent I spent many years uh, studying Russian and learning to love Russia and, and, and all things but Russian. But nevertheless, and, and that, that are so our so bombs <laughs> that destroy no, innocent uh, civilians I'm, I'm everywhere. Not, I'm not saying they all are, but sometimes they are, right? Uh, never. Uh, never. Uh, so never. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Only American and American marionettes of ISIS and the other Shat uh, al-Nusra bombs are killing innocent civilians. Because those are the only ones that That's are killing our interpretation, innocent. our but, vision. But you can't really believe that. I mean, I don't believe it. I, I, I don't believe that uh, that Russia is is responsible for all the destruction. Neither do I believe it's responsible for none of the destruction. I mean, it's just not not credible. No. But w w when we see Western media, we see when, for example, someone someone uh, is a little bit on the other uh, try to say that maybe not in any case the Russian bombers that destroy the civilians so it is cut so maybe personally there are the people who are uh, with broader uh, sense of understanding reality but if we, t we take the Western media we see that normal normal uh, reportage, uh, normal uh, observation of what is going on with Syria is completely biased mm -hmm. by this pre uh, preconceived I, I, ideas. And I understand that. And, 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 the and, same, and the I same. recognize that. But but isn't it true that that Russian television has seen the that same. there is yeah. there is Absolutely. implicit bias in in where in how people so. where they are, and they've they've taken it and multiplied it. We by could a say we could speak on. Two levels. Yeah. If you affirm that the West says the truth and the Russia says lie, I would respond: Russia says truth. Right. That this truth is absolute truth, and the West and, says and, and, and lie. Okay, so we're On playing a check. If I say to you, if I say to you, Western journalists are often biased and mistaken, but they try to tell the truth. Whereas Russian no, TV no, has no, gone no, through no, the no, other no, side. No, 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 and uh, if you say uh, that, uh, and they're not uh, even trying to tell the truth. If you say anymore. that Western TV yeah. is sometimes biased, mm -hmm. sometimes not, mm -hmm. I would say Russian TV is sometimes biased, sometimes not. If you say we are sometimes not biased, but you are always biased, I would say exactly you are sometimes biased, we are sometimes so not always biased. exactly equal. Absolutely, <laughs> and that is multipolarity. Right. There, nobody has monopoly on the truth. The truth is relative. I could accept that, M but only if you accept that. Mm -hmm. If you say our truth is absolute, I would respond immediately. Our truth is ex absolute. I don't believe that, and you don't believe it. Or maybe you believe, if you believe that your truth is absolute, you are normal Western man. 
but normal I Western. don't believe anyone's truth is absolute. OK, we, we <laughs> could agree on that at least. Okay. Well, everything is <clears throat> Alexander Dugan, um, he's a, uh, first time I listened to him, I was thinking to myself, like, boy, this is uh, his, some of his ideas, uh, you wouldn't think that would be a, a part of the, uh, the, the conversation now, but it seems his power behind his words was so riveting for me. And the idea that truth equals belief uh, is a very troubling way of perceiving the world because we have come to an understanding that truth is based on evidence and facts and, 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 and uh, cred cred credibility, whereas it can be switched and perverted. Now, Alexander Dugin is a Russian political theorist with these controversial views and ideas and he's a contributing author to the Catheon think tank, which the New York Times accuses of pushing Russian propaganda through fake news media sites. His website operates in 38 languages and displays far right ideas recognizable in Russian domestic politics. Dugan has planned courses for the Russian Military General Staff Academy stood as a department head of Moscow Uni State University and been featured prominently on both Russian state-run media and conserv conservative media with close ties to the Russian government. Journalists, of course, Western ones, have called him Putin's brain or Putin's favorite philosopher. The accolades go on. And he is a far-right ideologue who makes it no secret that he has studied left-wing thinkers and taken up their theories to advance his own agenda, which is to tear down modernity and the West. Now he is famous for his book, uh, The Foundations of Geopolitics, The Geopolitical Future of Russia. This was published in 1997 after the close of the Soviet empire. Well, after the Soviet empire fell, there was a period where the Russian identity was, um, wasn't certain. They didn't know who they were anymore. They didn't, you know, as communism fell, they had no sense of purpose. And, and, and so as they were swimming along, do we join the Western idea? Do we become part of the, uh, the Western world? And uh, they made roads and open uh, you know, possibilities for that. One of the interesting things between this time period, uh, between uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, which was in 1991, and 1997, when Dugin wrote this book, uh, there was a thing uh, in 1994 that involved Ukraine called the Budapest Memorandum. And it was in that Budapest Memorandum that uh, Boris Yeltsin, president of Russia at that time, uh, President uh, Clinton and the president of Ukraine signed a memorandum that Ukraine would surrender its nuclear weapons, which was over, I think over a thousand nuclear weapons to Russia with the understanding that, uh, that they would be their own self-governing nation and that they would uh, you know, have their sovereignty guaranteed. They were actually the third greatest uh, nuclear power in the world after the fall of the Soviet Union. And they surrendered it willingly uh, with the, with the, uh, under the, the uh, understanding that we would be there to protect them and that we would guarantee their, their sovereignty. So that's an important little bit of history for, for us to know as we understand the deeper dimensions of what's going on in this horrible war. Uh, now, Dugan was, you know, saw and he was coming to the West to be able to study with some of the, um, the, the people in London about the different, and he, read, and he started figuring out this geopolitics, books that were written in the 19th century uh, about the powers that were then Russia and Great Britain. And there was the sea power, which was Great Britain and the land power, which was Russia. 
And it was this geopolitical uh, understanding of how the way the world worked. And that was when he clicked in his idea that uh, the geopolitical uh, catastrophe that happened when the Soviet Union fell left an, a vacuum open that the sea powers now represented by America came in and uh, to assert their power. That was his interpretation. So this single book he wrote, he wrote it in 1997. And it has signaled every significant foreign policy move of the Russian Federation over the following two decades. The United States, Europe, and every nation intertwined with Russia failed to see the signs. From the annexation of Crimea in 2014, to Britain's exit from the European Union, or Brexit, this grand strategy was laid out in Alexander Dugan's book and has unfolded beautifully in a disastrous manner for the Western rules-based international order. Now, Dugan presented the world order as one of the teleurocracies, the land powers, versus the philosophy the lassocracies, the lassocracies, <laughs> sorry, I can't pronounce that, the sea powers of Eurasia versus the Atlanticists. Now, the Atlanticists, Dugan claims, are the United States, Britain, and Europe. And they seek to dominate the world through NATO and other international institutions. In the socio-political spectrum, Dugan is actually a traditionalist, a fascist, and an anti-Semite. In the geopolitical realm, he is an aggressive Russian nationalist. And most telling, however, is how many of his earlier strategies and destructive stratagems have actually come to fruition. Now, this book, this Foundations of Geopolitics, uh, The Geopolitical Future of Russia, is a 600-page textbook uh, that includes excerpts from some of history's most prolific strategists, and which is perceived as very influential in the ruling class and military circles. I actually watched an interview that uh, Dugan had done just right after the invasion of Ukraine. And uh, yes, uh, I think you're right there, Deb. Um, he, he was almost exuberant in, in talking about, and as we're witnessing and watching the horrors unfold and the people rising up to stand against this, it was this exuberance that he felt, and this interview was done on March 5th, um, that he felt that this was bringing back the, the land power that had been so severely crippled after the uh, catastrophe of the socio uh, of the Soviet Union. And um, it was uh, he in that video, uh, as he's almost gushing over, uh, and it's very the, the, the geopolitical strategists are very the realists, and that's what he was saying about Putin is that he's not an idealist, he's, not a, he's a realist. This is, this is the reality of pushing back into our power as a, as a world superpower. And it's cold. There's no heart in it. There's no feeling. It's just, this is the way it is. And he, um, he explained that it was during this time when he wrote this book that he, ended up writing courses for the, the military academies. The, I think I set it up earlier, um, where this was welcomed and it was uh, definitely um, incorporated into, the, into these higher ruling and military circles. And which led, he says, in part to the secret rise of Putin. Now, the book is in eight parts each with chapters and subchapters, and he establishes the strategies of Russia's adversaries. 
devises his own and provides bold steps to regain Russia's position of dominance lost at the end of the Cold War. The most trenchant of these recommendations included the invasion of Georgia, which occurred in 2008, the annexation of Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the Ukrainian war going on now, the separation of Britain from the rest of Europe, Brexit, and the sowing of dev divisive seeds in the United States. This most chilling section is on American politics. And remember, this is written in 1997. Russia, Dugan writes, should, and this is a quote from the book, quote, introduce geopolitical disorder into internal American activity, encouraging all kinds of separatism and ethnic, social, and racial conflicts, actively supporting all dissident movements, extremist, racist, and sectarian groups, thus destabilizing internal political processes in the United States." End quote. It would also make sense, he continues to, quote, support isolationist tendencies in American politics, end quote. Now, Dugan, you would think he, he, he would uh, stand on one side, that he would be just this right-wing, you know, ideologue, um, fascist, but he's not. He actually wants a left-wing, excuse me, a left-right alliance against liberalism. Now, he, in that video, you saw him and mentioned th th that he wants to see the world in a, uh, the lens of a multipolar world, where it's not just a unipolar world where the United States is the one who's controlling everything, this you know, one world order that they say, or it's a multipolar world. And you know, where there's Russia, there's China, there's others. And it sounds very progressive. And it sounds very forward-looking, but it's not. It's actually a return to more nationalistic, anti-gay, anti-universal human rights, authoritarian-style government, theocracy, autocracy, monarchies. It is anti-West and anti-modernity. They want to roll back history to a golden time. Now, in the, in the, in the Russian philosopher's account, in Dugan's account, liberalism, with a capital L, is the first of the three political theories of modernity with the latter two being socialism and or communism, which challenged liberalism from the left and fascism, which challenged it from the right. Now, liberalism grew out of the enlightenment and it favors the individual over the collective identity. Examples are national, ethnic, religious, class, and negative freedom. So it's freedom from rather than or over positive freedom, which is freedom to. And Dugan describes this conception of liberalism as producing, quote, the most disgusting formula of slavery, inasmuch as it tempts man to an insurrection against God, against traditional values against the moral and spiritual foundations of his people and his culture, end quote. In Dugan's view, liberalism is an absolute evil that must be destroyed. To do this, 
he is more than ready to employ left-wing critiques of liberalism, capitalism, and modernity itself. Now, Dugan's ideology and political stances can often seem very baffling. I mean, because he, 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 he could be labeled a fascist and then now he's working with these uh, left-wing critiques. And it's, so it can be very incorrect to just simply reason that he's this neo-fascist because uh, neo-fascism, that's a modern, fascism is a modern ideology. Um, but Dugan's political ideology is, as he puts it, is unmodern. It's an unmodern theory that, quote, completely discards the idea of the irreversibility of history, end quote. He's completely disregarding the irreversibility of history. So what is that? That tells us what his real ultimate aim is and goal behind everything he writes and does. He wants to destroy modernity and reverse history. Indeed, the very idea of progress is offensive and downright evil to do gain. It is the work of the Antichrist. Amazingly, he manages to use the language of the left, even when he is disparaging the very notions of progress, which is the foundations of any truly left-wing politics. This is a Dugan on that, on that idea. This is his quote. The very ideology of progress is racist in its structure. The assertion that the present is better and more fulfilling than the past and continual assurances that the future will be even better than the present are discriminations against the past and the present as well as the humiliation of all those who lived in the past and a violation of the right of the dead." End quote. Now, let's look at the 2016 election. Obviously, there was a whole infrastructure that was built up over time, as you see that this was a policy, this was, a, this was uh, led up in their ruling circles, in their military circles, in, their, in, their, in the heads of state, it was, it was absorbed, it was a, a, a part of their thinking that they developed these structures, infrastructures to be able to promote disinformation, create chaos, create disruption, interfere in our elections. Now, the Kremlin didn't so much support Trump as he, they supported the chaos he represented, which is pretty evident. And as new evidence has come out, it has become very clear that the Russian agents were also acting through the internet to bolster the candidacies of Bernie Sanders and Green Party nominee Jill Stein as well. Ultimately, what their goal was, was the purpose of this Russian misinformation that Dugan had articulated in his book that this was the only way how we could bring down America. We can't match them militarily. We can't match them economically, but we can sow discord on the inside. We can create chaos. And so the entire purpose of the Russian misinformation campaign was to create that confusion and to destabilize or Western democracy, just as Dugan had advised 20 years earlier. Now, could Dugan have asked for a better result? <laughs> Object, our understanding of truth, objective truth. You just heard it in that video, truth is belief. If I believe it enough, even though it's a lie, it becomes truth. That postmodernism, my thinking and ideas, and it, it, it turns everything upside down. Well, objective truth now has become harder and harder to find. While trust in our media, along with other institutions, is at an all-time low. 
truth as Dugan said, is, is citing the postmodernist is relative. And the Western Enlightenment narrative promoting progress, science, individual freedoms, universal rights is just one of many narratives. And that the fact that Russian media organizations like R uh, RT and Sputnik, which has stated that their goal is to point, quote, the way to a multipolar world that respects every country's national interests, culture, history, and traditions, end quote. It gives a platform to both far right and left wing perspectives. But the primary goal is to muddy the waters and counter Western liberalism at all costs. So Dugan can sound like a left winger when discussing things like Western imperialism and racism or cultural relativism and capitalism, which makes him and, and people like him and like his all very dangerous. Because it, like, anti-capitalist leftist, Dugan and other far-right ideologues reject the neoliberal order and global capitalism, but for completely different reasons. The reactionaries. And reactionaries are anti-modern and therefore want to restore the status quo ante that preceded the revolutionary changes of the enlightenment, capitalism, and modernity. For a Russian like Dugan, this means restoring the Russian Empire of the, of the Tsarist era. For an Islamic extremist, it means restoring the caliphate. And for an American white supremacist, it means the restoration of systemic racism and the creation of an ethno state. So for any true progressive, the status quo, and yes, that means liberalism and capitalism is clearly preferable to the status quo ante of feudalism, autocracy, monarchy, and theocracy. Even if the ultimate goal is to replace the status quo with something, eventually with something better. So this idea of a multipolar world may sound appealing to many of us on the left who rightly oppose US interventionism and imperialism, but it is ultimately an ideological tool for reactionaries like Dugan, who stand in firm opposition to progressive and democratic values. So what is Dugan's ultimate goal? Just as a reminder, and remember he's had the minds he has influence. He may not be in Putin's brain, but there are certainly elements here, language here that you've heard. I'm sure you've heard Putin speak about the geopolitical catastrophe of the fall of the Soviet Union. Well, guess what? Where this all comes from? This man and his ideas. What is Dugan's goal? He wants to destroy modernity and reverse history. And surprisingly, there is a spiritual metaphysical philosophy behind this. And it's called traditionalism, with a capital T. Now, traditionalism, uh, it's adherence, it, it, adherence to this arcane school have made homes for themselves in nationalist populist movements. And examples of this, the, the incendiary populist agenda, which traditionalists are associated. Border walls, contempt for the elite, isolationism, the targeting of racial and sexual minorities, these are secondary preparatory, preparatory work. This is secondary work for an altogether grander project. At its core, traditionalism rejects modernity and all its ideals. 
faith in the ability of human ingenuity to advance living standards and justice. An emphasis on the management of the economy, the coveting of individual liberty, the existence of universal truths equally valid for and thereby equalizing of all. They are repudiating the enlightenment. Traditionalists instead celebrate what they regard as timeless values. They honor precedence rather than progress, emphasize the spiritual over the material, and advocate surrender to the fundamental disparities as opposed to equality between humans and human destiny. Now this philosophy can sound very abstract and how hardly the doctrine of people who would be making policy and guiding them. And indeed it wasn't until recently that traditionalism really kind of took root. It wasn't, had, it didn't have anything originally to do with politics. It was originated, the original uh, patriarch to this uh, doctrine was a French occultist and philosopher named René Guyon. That's G-U-E-N-O-N, -E René Guyon, 1886 to 1951, who wrote extensively about Hinduism. He was a huge, very fascinated with the cycles of the, the, the different golden age cycles and we're in the Kali uh, Yuga cycle now and he was trying to, and he really wrote extensively about it, but he eventually converted to Islam. However, he, traditionalists regard re various religions as having authentic paths to enlightenment, but just tend to devote themselves to one. Now, two of Guignon's ideas gained an unintended legacy into right-wing politics. First was a concept of time as cyclical, which was, which was extracted and generalized from Hinduism. So instead of advancing through history in a linear fashion, like we have in the, in the, in the Greek world, in the Greek mind, in the Roman, uh, understanding uh, the progress moves from beginning to end, Christian understandings, secular humanists, Marxists, uh, libertarians, that we implicitly believe that's how marching through time. In his understanding, in the Hindu understanding is that humanity is engulfed in a cycle, a pattern of eternal return. And this cycle proceeds four ages. You have uh, moving from golden to silver, to bronze, to the dark, to the Kali Yuga, right? And right now we are many uh, in the Hindu uh, spiritual tradition and believe we are in the Kali Yuga and all this chaos and all this disruption that is occurring everywhere on the planet. And that after a cataclysmic event, that chaos, that disorder, that cataclysmic event leads to a return back to the golden age. Thus, save for that moment of return, save for the moment of return, time is tantamount to decline. So indeed, time is, decline is the only thing humanity can really hope for. And since we're gradually worsening of the world situation indicates that the cycle is actually advancing and that darkness will soon burst into gold. When decline will set in motion again and so on and so on and so on. Now, the second concept that would migrate from Guanon's philosophy into contemporary politics was the idea of social hierarchy, social hierarchy. Traditionalists believe the Hindu and European caste hierarchy corresponds to the turning of the ages. So during the golden age that we all learn back to and we dream of and we remember, they claim priests, and spiritual values reigned over a social order made up of warriors, merchants, 
And finally, at the bottom of the pyramid, slaves. And so, as the age turns, boundaries between castes disintegrate and culminating in a sprawling slave society, infatuated with materiality and hostile to spiritual pursuits. There is a political dimension to this social disintegration too. Theocracy and the reign of a spiritual elite devolve into the reign of the masses, which is to say democracy or communism. Traditionalism thus deals in a series of oppositions between the spiritual and material, quality and quantity, the social stratification and mass homogenization. So what are they saying? What I'm, what I'm saying here is that to the traditionalist, modernism in all its forms this is the symptom of the disease. So being uh, the democracy is the disease. It is part of the symptoms of the Kali Yuga. Universal human rights, that's a symptom. We need to return back to that. So this liberal school of thought, though, was not politicized actually by Guignon, but by a rambunctious follower of his from Italy named Julius Evola. And Evola crafted a more expressly reactionary traditionalism by introducing the gendered and racial dimensions of these oppositions. To Evola, the opposite poles of the social hierarchy were also Aryan and non-Aryan, masculine and feminine, such that as the ideal society would not only be theocratic, unequal and hostile to change, but also dominated by Aryan men. Evola, and I'm Italian, I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't, I regarded himself as being to the political right of fascism and Nazism, both of which he saw as merely promising starts. He thought fascism represented a step backwards in a positive sense, a retreat from the brink of mass egalitarian society. If he could only introduce spirituality into Hitler's and Mussolini's militarism, perhaps the rewinding of time could be accomplished and a golden age of theocratic virtue restored. You know who else was, uh, is familiar with um, the works of Guyon and Evola? Steve Bannon. Donald Trump's former strategist at the White House and a friend of Alexander Dugan. So for Dugan, traditionalism is a call to arms and uh, it's figuratively and literally, it means war between the values of tradition, continuity, the preservation of local particularity, theocracy, and the leveling forces of modernity, free markets, democracy, universal human rights. But traditionalism is also a war between states, between Russia flanked by its Eurasian partners and the West led by the US. So what are the ultimate aims of the traditionalists? First, to establish a horizontal difference by destroying internationalism and then craft a world of islands led by the land powers and the sea powers. Second, establish a vertical difference with a theocratic hierarchy by sacralizing the otherwise modernist and secular institutions of the nation state. For the influential acolytes of traditionalism, nationalism would thus be merely the opening salvo of, of a crusade to resegment and remystify the world. So that is what is behind what is going on in Russia. It has been planned for a long time. But what so far has blocked the realization of this thus far is the Ukrainian question. 
the Ukrainian people and the leadership of President Voldemort Zelensky. And I wanna share with you another video as we move to honor Ukrainians. Всім добрий вечір. Лідер фракції тут. Голова офісу президента тут. Прем'єр-міністр Шмигаль тут. Подаляк тут. Президент тут. Всі ми тут. Наші військові тут. Громадяни суспільства тут. Всі ми тут. Захищаємо нашу незалежність нашу державу. І так буде і далі. Слава нашим захисникам, слава нашим захисницям. Слава Україні! Слава Героям слава! слава. слава. That's one thing they didn't count on. They didn't realize that uh, the leadership of a man who was an actor who seemed unprepared for the offices that he was going to take on to be able to stand up against these opposing forces that had been brewing for 20, 30 years, that he would live up to the moment, that he would meet this moment with character and dignity and, and, and strength for his people. Um, when I see uh, Zelensky, I, I see the leader I always wanted to be as an officer in the military. I see this a man who I, uh, to be able to stand up and to inspire people like he did in that video where he didn't run. He, he stood there in that town square to remind his people that he didn't leave them. And when asked when he was given the opportunity to leave, he said, I need ammunition, not a ride. I need ammunition, not a ride. And that to me, uh, shows a huge difference between the leadership of, of what we have become so accustomed to in our leaders and, and what really taps deep into our soul. And, and he speaks in a way that I think we need to look at the leadership styles here of the two opposing leaders uh, of these two nations. Putin has been ruling this country for 22 years. Zelensky was a new guy. Politics, president for three years. Putin was a former KGB agent. Zelensky was a comedy actor. Putin went from powerful men in most one of the most powerful men in the world to being a dictator, an emperor. And in a video that I watched recently where uh, Dugan was talking uh, on a, um, uh, it was a Middle East uh, interview. Uh, called him uh, uh, Putin a dictator, uh, emperor, a monarch. Um, Zelensky has become a symbol of Ukraine's resistance. No one expected Zelensky to become such a storied leader, such a strong leader. Putin, he likes to hide away in his secret bunker and palace. He is Communication with others is by sitting at a very long table, distance. His inner circle and friends, he keeps them at a distance too. Why? Probably because he's afraid, paranoid, which is very common among tyrants throughout history. You're afraid for your life. You can't trust the people around you. And it is the nature of the tyrant. And he just needs to be as far away as possible. Or just, he doesn't really communicate with his people aside from the stadium talk that he had recently. And he mostly gives pre-recorded talks that don't provide much information. Now, Putin faked a meeting with female reps. I don't know if any of you saw that video, but it was, it was uh, at first it was, he was sitting around with his uh, 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 women from the, uh, the, the, the airlines and they were sitting right there around the table. And he was talking and uh, you can actually clearly see his hand going through the microphone. Now he has closed the door on digital media. 
uh, website resources, including Facebook and Instagram, because they oppose any propaganda. Uh, it's only state controlled information that are available to Russians. Uh, the media can't use the word war or invasion to describe the situation in Ukraine, calling it a special operation instead. He refuses to call Zelensky by his name, but refers to him as the leader of a gang of drug addicts and neo-Nazis and uses phrases like Kiev regime. Uh, he has become the face of cruelty, injustice, and tyranny. Now Zelensky has refused to leave the city of Kiev. Like I said, he says, I need ammunition, not a ride, even though he's under attack. He knows he must be there for his people in this darkest of hours. He's not afraid, even though there's been several assassination attempts on his life. Amazingly, he still maintains a sense of humor. Uh, he even asked Putin to meet and talk, where he says, sit down with me to negotiate, just not at 30 meters. I don't bite. He gives updates about the situation in Ukraine in front of a very real mic. He moves it. <laughs> uh, he is red-eyed, he, he, uh, unshaven and exhausted, like all the Ukrainians are. Uh, he's replaced his suit with an army green t-shirt. He doesn't stay inside hiding. He walks the streets of Kyiv. His colleagues, military men, journalists, filmmakers, Sean Penn, uh, who was there. I recently watched an uh, interview with him uh, and that he's been in constant communication. He was there and, and he trusts and communicates with them every day. He visits the wounded of Ukrainian soldiers in hospitals to cheer them up. Digital media is welcome and, and he's an expert on social media. He has a commitment to the unshakable and bravery of his people. And he's an inspiration to millions. He's the kind of a leader our world needs. Not the dictator who knows how to use fear and aggressive tactics, take things by force. But is approachable, strong, and a candid leader who can unite people. Okay, I'd like to open it up now uh, just to kind of get people's, there's a lot of information shared um, and I'm sure there are, there are things that people want to say about the Ukraine war and I want to be able to provide the space and open it up so that people can share their thoughts uh, about the, uh, the teaching tonight and to also share what uh, might be going on with their hearts. Uh, concerning this very grave situation that we are witnessing in the world and we are a part of. Okay. Is there anybody who wants to start off the, uh, the group discussion? So, uh, Charlie, how would how do we help folks in this situation? You know, what can we do to um, provide them with the energy to continue to carry on? Because in some ways, they are um, defending the democracy that we've created or try to create in this country. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, go ahead. Sorry, this is Paul. I, I actually have a couple of things to say, but um, I'm just coming in from the garden. So uh, if whenever there's an open moment, I'll chime in. Well, I, let me just answer that. Uh, you know, I think it's, um, to me, it's when you can, you know, helping, praying helps, 
you know, working on our, our, our commitments to our own democratic ideals, recognizing and seeing um, the challenges that they all face. You know, I, I witnessed and watched people are willing to sacrifice them, their lives for that. And I think that serves as a wake up call for all of us, to how precious it is for people who don't have the, the, the freedoms that we, that we are to take for granted sometimes. I think we need to to, to uh, be able to have conversations that really highlight what's going on and to be able to really dedicate ourselves to living up to those high ideals and 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 helping where you can help, you know, giving money to reputable organizations that are that are going out there and, and giving uh, food to these refugees that are coming across. And, um, so, uh, supporting those organizations that are really going out there to to uh, to find people homes and jobs and places that are being you know these millions of people that are being displaced. Uh, I think those are places where we can help. And then I think it's really important for us to be able to stay healthy ourselves, to be able to look at the darkness. One of the things I think we have to see the darkness as it is, not what as we want it to be. And then we can do something about it. And, uh, and that's part of the, the, the challenge is, is to how do we get through to what's really going on? And, and, and that may be a process. This is only the initiating step in, in being able to help understand some of the deeper dimensions that are going on and to be able to you know, inform and educate. I think education really helps uh, because we begin to make better decisions when we are when we allow ourselves to um, hear it from different perspectives and to be able to glean the truth from what is being said. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, Chuck, but I think I'm, I'm hoping I did. And um, Yeah, thanks, um, Charlie. Hey, Paul, do you want to go next? If you're at a good spot. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, hang on just one second. Um, there. Um, yeah, I so I have some thoughts around the philosophical aspect and some questions. Mm -hmm. um, because the way I've so for quite some time I've I've um, I've judged the U.S. as as an empire and um, you know having this massive military and you know all of the possible and real consequences of of having that kind of um, influence in the world through violence um, you know taking leaders of of foreign nations, you know, and in strikes. I mean, just some of those kinds of things I've have um, stirred me in really hard ways. And and I also view and, and so this invasion of the Ukraine has kind of upset kind of my worldview. Like, is that kind of massive military needed? That's on the one side. And then on the other side, I, I also see uh, the world continuing to evolve, you know, enlightenment led to, to the modern era. And, and now we are, I believe, moving into a, a postmodern era. And um, the, I, I, I do have this sense of, of, like my language is this kind of sense of, you know, on the one side, you know, a group of people saying, you know, which I could kind of label similar to what you had said, this idea of traditionalists, um, you know, kind of let's, whoa, let's go back. And then, you know, perhaps there is a forward movement. I, I, and I'll just, you know, a something of what is, you know, a continued evolution of, of democracy. And, and I'll just say this, like, very simplistically, um, Carl Jung talks about in The Undiscovered Self, this idea of, you know, the state, 
you know, what he called the creeds, which are organized religions, and then the religions, which are this kind of uh, connection with truth. And, and he suggests that, you know, both the state and the creeds use statistical rationalism, you know, three out of five men, seven out of 10 women, to control the masses, to influence kind of behavior and choices. And it's the religions, this kind of experience with truth, personal experience with truth, that provides the energy for individuals to stand up against, you know, kind of this, um, what he, he describes as both the creeds and the, the, the state will devolve into totalitarianism just naturally. Somebody will figure out that they can say anything enough times and, and the people who aren't centered within themselves, the religions, will follow after it. So I just wonder if this is part of an evolution of, of mankind. I also just, um, for context, have found a lot of benefit in Christian spirituality and this kind of like, which I interpret to have this kind of ongoing growth, this kind of preparing the bride in Christian lingo. So anyway, I, I just wonder how that, you know, that kind of mindset marries because some of the languages, as you had mentioned, is overlapping um, in context. So thanks for any thoughts on that. Well, I think it is. There's a lot of overlap that goes on, and it's it's in, you know, um, being able to grasp that there are other dimensions that are at work here, and working in the in the in the in, in the dual dimension in the three D world, uh, we have to be able to recognize when people are co opting real, true spiritual practices and true things that are happening that are letting us move towards that evolution. But these forces will have an impact on us. And if we're not having the clear eyes to see things as they are, um, we, we put ourselves in jeopardy of not allowing that evolution to occur. That mm. we will have those, those, those fallings into um, degradation in those cycles. I think that the, the one, the, the soul that we all have is impacted by these events on such a profound way that we have to be able to see things in, and try to know where has this something, an idea been taken away and co-opted to benefit their ideology or their idea of what they perceive as the direction humanity needs to go. And because I think that, you know, yeah, Carl Jung wanted us to be able to tap into, you know, recognizing our shadow, integrating our shadow, that it was one of the, um, one of our more, our highest moral duty that we could do as human beings was to integrate our shadows. Oh. That was one, that was what he, it was about that and to be able, well, this is a collective shadow that we're looking at and we need to integrate. We need to be able to see it. We need to be able to, to, to understand it. And it's not easy. It's not easy to do that. And so, yeah, reaching into some of those things that helps us to move through it. But again, what part of this shadow can I turn into light? What part of this Ukraine experience can I turn into light? What can I turn? How can I make this a better? What can I do? What part of my shadow do I need? Where am I being judgmental? Where am I um, being um, autocratic in my life? Where am I being, uh, you know, uh, against, uh, you know, being anti anti anything? Where am I? Where am I being in that? How am I contributing to this? Because that's that's how it manifests. Is where we all had a part in making this possible. All right, now where do I need to shine a light in my life so that I could take some of this darkness away, so that I can I can convert what I'm seeing towards peace in me? Where have I been um, dictatorial? Where have I been um, judgmental? You know, all of those things are what was being active us individually as this war unfolds. 
And that's where we can work on the higher dimensions, the higher planes of existence that we all want to be on. We want to be in that love, compassion, um, embracing all of life and, and, and allowing it to flow um, effortlessly and easily for all people. And when these things come up, we can't run from it. We have to integrate it. And that's, and that's why a, a, a class like this can be so difficult sometimes because it's not easy to look at. But that's what we're being asked to do. To shine the light on our own shadow so that we can, we can just make those little conversions ever so slight that affects the greater whole because everything is connected. All things are connected. Mm -hmm. yeah. All things are connected. This is affecting us and we're affecting it. And we can convert it because one of those great metaphysical truths is that change is constant. Change is constant. And we are more powerful than we realize. We are more powerful than we realize once we understand what it is that we are, are dealing with we have a power that we can really convert this into something good. And it's up to all of us to be able to do that. To take that light and shine it just a little bit brighter in our own lives. Thank you. Preach it. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it, sir. Hey, Charlie, Paul. I think uh, Floyd's got his hand up. And then Deb. Floyd and then Deb. Uh, thank you. Floyd. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Chuck. Everyone. Um, <clears throat> first time I want to say we don't live in a democracy, we live in a republic. And it's a big distinction. It's important that we pay attention to that. So we're not under the illusion of something we call a democracy even though uh, that republic has alluded to certain freedoms that we have, such as a gathering and a meeting like this. Mm. The second part is I want to say, I am adamantly uh, to the core of my bones against war. I lived through a war, I survived a war. I had no illusions about any country, any country that proposes war. In war itself, the, 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 the people the, who pays the price are the civilians, are the innocent people. They always pay the price of, of whatever happens, whoever's pushing it. I saw it, I've seen it, I've seen, I've been in countries I've seen the colonization, um, I've seen the destruction. I have no illusion of America. I have no illusion that we are some great country. When you've seen villages destroyed, wiped out, everything wiped out in front of your eyes. I have no illusion. I wasn't on, I wasn't sitting in, in the ground in, in Fallujah when they, when they eliminated that city, absolutely destroyed everything within the city, America. I, I don't know if having a lot of power means you get to do that and get away with it. We're sitting here critiquing Russia. We've never looked into our own shadow and the destruction that we have wreaked havoc on and this and around the world. I feel I feel absolutely devastated by what's happening in, in, in the Ukraine. I feel devastated of what the Germans did to Russia. I feel devastated of what happened in Iraq, what happened in, 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 in Afghanistan, what happened in Libya. And because we don't know the truth, we're not being the truth of what happened. If we do a little bit investigate and look under the hood, it's not so pretty. Not so pretty. What our politicians, what our CIA, what the what they're up to, you know, and uh, and the, the uh, eradication of world leaders because uh, they have they happen to have oil, 
because they happen to have a resource that we want. That's empire, feeding the empire. It's what it does, it's colonization at its core. I don't agree what Russia is doing. I'm not happy with that. I think the problem isn't, I think that any war, we have to ask ourselves what we're doing. That such a history of violence on mankind, of what we're doing to each other, that is repeated and those wounds are carried on to generations upon generations upon generations. I don't know how Russia could have stood, could have, could have, would have, should have handled knowing that there were 20 to 30, 26 to 30 uh, bioweapons, bioweapons labs created by our own, by, by America sitting on the border of Russia. And how, how would, how would I handle if suddenly over the course of Mexico, 30 bio labs are sitting on the other side of the border put there by the Chinese or the Russians, or nuclear weapons suddenly were stockpiled on the other side of the border, or missiles suddenly were set up to point into our country. How would we handle that? I pray for the Ukraine people. They're caught in the crossfire of, of, of whatever. We're not innocent. Our country is not innocent. There, there's a whole brigade of neo-Nazis in Ukraine fighting for the neo-Nazi, for that party, you know? That's, that doesn't fare well for a country that lost 20 to 30 million people in World War II by the Nazis. So I, I don't think any of this is the way to handle it, how nice it would have been to really sit down. Our own president, uh, George Bush Jr. said his job was to, it was to keep telling the story till everybody believed it and it became the truth. Our president said that. I listened to that interview, I was shocked. He didn't say it was the truth. He said he has to keep telling the story till everyone believed it. At least he admitted it. At least he admitted to what's going on. There's not a whole lot of scientific belief behind that one. I don't have the answer. I just know that it's not war. It's not war. I mean, I understand war if I'm to, to defend whatever, you know. I mean, I'm, if I was called in to go pull people out of Ukraine, I would probably go, you know, because it's inside of me. You know? But I also know that it's important to, that somewhere really looking into the shadow of this whole thing. That's my job to find some kind of a still point, some kind of a quiet place to hold it. Because I know what craziness is. I know what the darkness is. I know what hopelessness feels like. So I, I, I pray, I hold, hold a certain silence, a certain quiet place inside of myself. And I grieve. There was a time that, that my rage I felt was unstoppable. And then that rage became grief. And that grief is, is unrequitable, it's unending. It's unending when I look into this. There is no end to it. The only end is when I can fall into the center and go quiet. No, and I'm doing the best I can. So thank you for letting me share. I hope I didn't talk too much. Thank you. Um, so. Thanks, Floyd. No, so Floyd, good. everything you say is always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Go, go ahead. Yeah, and, and is your de name Deb? No, it's not. It's my wife's Peter. <laughs> Peter. Thanks, Peter. Peter. It's, not, it's our computer. Um, you know what? Uh, Floyd pretty much said, I think, captured exactly, you know, kind of where I'm at on this thing. He, he said, I don't think anyone here could say it better than he just did. Really great. Um, I, I had a hard time hanging in there, I have to tell you, because, I, you know, you're an your analysis of a fairly complex 
set of international relations uh, was, in my opinion, way too dualistic. I think the way that you're framing this is very dangerous. Uh, there's no effort to really understand uh, not just this, not just Russian psychology, but the, the shadow that's ever present in this country and is and, and of which has done a lot to contribute to this horrific situation, and that the Ukrainians are caught in the middle. And um, you know, the, just the idea that we're continuing to pump weapons in there uh, and going to set this up to be a prolonged guerrilla war. I, I, I suspect the Russians are too smart for this, but the, the thought of it is quite nauseating. I, I've seen enough dirty wars. You know, I've, I wasn't, you know. So anyway, I think Floyd pretty much said it very poetically. I, I really like that. And that's the point I want to make, I, that we should be more complex in our thinking of this. We should be, make efforts to try to understand uh, not just our own view, but the view of the other side, and not just primarily through some you know, political philosophy. There, there's a lot of forces at work in terms of what Putin's calculations are. So uh, I guess that's all I wanted to say. Uh, anyway, I want to be respectful about it, but I had a hard time hanging in here. You know what? And you know what, Peter? That's exactly one of the reasons why I wanted to have that to be able to stimulate discussion, to be able to stimulate ideas. That's part of the process too, is to be able to articulate and say, by the way, you know, I thought you were the, the direction you went with that was completely off course. And then insert it. To me, that's, that's the richness, that's the dialogue, that's the conversation, that's where the healing happens. You know, sure. That's where that happens. And yes, I did take it from one perspective, but it was to uh, my heart, I am against war. I hate war. I, and I, my heart goes out to the Ukrainian people caught in the middle of this. And, and we cannot avoid our own shadow and the horrible things that we have done on this in wars. In plan. I, that was not, it was just to try to understand, at least crack open the leg, give a little discussion about where this might be coming from and how this, where it originated or some of the things that um, that are at, that are behind this, that are at work behind this, it is so big to really understand. And I've watched some of the stuff that has was on some of the the, the Russian media and stuff. So I'm trying to be broad and 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 and, and open minded about everything because I think it's important. I really do, and and not to not to avoid. The horrors that we have inflicted on them, the horrors that we have done in the name of freedom, in the name of democracy, in the name of all of those things that we are supposed to defend. And so, you know, I, I think it, uh, um, you know, if I could go help like Floyd, I'd go help. You know, if I was worth it to help the people that are caught in the crosshairs. That are, they didn't do anything. The innocent people didn't do anything. It wasn't their fault. And yet they pay the price for our major errors. So, anybody else would like to contribute, share? Chuck? Yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach because. Um, Many of you may not know, but I started seminary and my teacher sent me this. He's uh, living as a sacred fool in the times of war. And I'm only going to read a little portion of it, but I think it's something we all need to consider what this idea of being a sacred fool is. He writes, as sacred fools, we say no to rage, mayhem, murder, when members of the normal rational society shout yes, and we're getting a lot of that. As sacred fools refuse to choose sides when others wave banners and fling slogans and insist on moral superiority as they castigate the evil. Oh, dig. 
de denigration of the chosen enemy. As sacred fools, we affirm the life force of Eros when others march in days lockstep enthralled by the death energy of Thanatos. As sacred fools, we do foolish things. We sit quietly on meditation cushions, pray, seek the calm point of healing. When others busily do the normal rational things, scream for guns, impose punitive sanctions, sent jet fighters, place doomsday missiles on world alert. As sacred fools, we embrace a different wisdom. This is the wisdom. Someone has the foolish enough to say, I don't support any of it. I don't support the Ukraine. I don't support Russia. I don't support the United States, NATO, the European Union. And I don't care the reasons because the reasons boil down to that they're killing human beings and they always have reasons for the killings. Putin has it, we have it. And again, the Ukraines are caught in the crossfire. The, pro the thing I do support, as I said, is, is the innocent victims. I really think that we need to start thinking about how we stop supporting our government or supporting people and saying, hey, we need to send all this money over there so we can continue this fight, because what are we really doing? We're continuing this Russian versus West or communism. And do we really understand what it really is that's going on? And I don't think we do. I think we think we do. But part of what the Russian philosopher was saying is, and we've all said it here, is we think we know what the truth is. And if we say the truth in a certain way and we do it long enough, we can create our own truth. Whether it's truthful or not, it doesn't matter. So I think that's what's partly... I know I have to do and not only shine the flashlight at myself, but shine it at everybody else, shine it at the Ukrainians, shine it at Russia, shine it at the Chinese, um, wherever, because we're all a part of this. What we think we have to really recognize here is that we're all on one earth. And if we don't start treating it in that way, we're just going to continue to beat the hell out of each other till one day we do it well enough that there's not room for humans to live on this earth. So I think I'm going to start looking at the sacred fool as a, as a path to follow versus shouting and screaming to try to keep wars going because we think that the other guy is worse than the people that um, we're supporting. Well, just to kind of coattail on that, Chuck, and I think it's really insightful. It's the, um, something that the Dalai Lama said. And he, uh, and it's kind of, you know, this idea of the sacred fool, you know, being open to the sacredness, even in the midst of violence. And he says, the Dalai Lama says, uh, it is the enemy who can truly teach us to practice the virtues of compassion and tolerance. I'll repeat it. It is the enemy who can truly teach us to practice the virtues of compassion and tolerance. And it is with compassion and tolerance that we begin to break down some of the barriers and the things that keep us from being able to recognize that we are all one on this planet. We are together, we are interconnected. What happens to one of us happens to all of us. And once we, and, and the only times we actually really see that, unfortunately, is when tragedy seems to happen, when violence seems to happen, when that we see how, when one thing impacts, when it hits one of us, it impacts all of us. If we could just make that switch to taking care of the planet, to ending all violence, all wars, to be able to recognize that if my kindness and my compassion and my generosity of spirit, as I extend that to others, it is also has the same powerful effect that can change the world, that can influence and change our world. 
so that we don't keep repeating this same pattern that humanity is, is, is caught in where we solve our problems in, through violence and war. We want to move into a place where we don't, we don't need to in, anymore. We, we, war should become obsolete. One man should not have this, or person should not have this much power to overthrow and create so much pain and suffering in the world. No one. And I think we have, you know, it's teaching me a lot of compassion, teaching me a lot of humility. Um, and so I hope I, each day I can continue to be a, a stronger light because of that. Floyd, my man. Thank you. Uh, I read an article the other day. Um, I don't remember the guy's name. I think behind, we have to look for who's the people behind Putin. Because I believe Putin also has his handlers as well. This whole thing is set up for chaos. One thing war does, it creates division and chaos. And as long as you, I'm in chaos with you, that sort of that sort of keeps, you know, as long as I keep chaos between you and Chuck, it sort of keeps me in power. I can kind of, I kind of call the shots at that point. The whole thing is what, who are the strings behind the whole thing? Who's pulling these strings? I believe Putin, even Putin has finances. The billionaires, the gazillionaires that sit behind him. And the same thing behind our government or even behind all these corporations. Who's really calling the shots? Who's behind it? You know, and I think that's that's a whole nother conversation about this quote unquote new world order. The thing is, is that we don't really see how this what's going on in Ukraine falls in falls into their roadmap of what's going on. In that regard, we are all enslaved in something. The whole thing. We think we're free. But there's someone pulling strings here, folks. There's someone pulling strings that keeps the whole thing going. You know, and I'm going to leave it there. You know, if I find that article, Charlie and Chuck, Chuck, I'll send it back. I have it somewhere in my in my 250 tabs that are open <laughs> in the computer. <laughs> I hear you, Floyd. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. the 250 tabs with the 25 screens open just to keep it from overwhelming you. Anybody have any other questions, comments, anything they want to share with us, with you? Kathleen. I see your fingers. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know how to do the hand thing yet or anything. So, um, hello, everyone. And uh, uh, I guess, you know, as a veteran, that it's been difficult for me to, to see what's going on in the Ukraine and put myself in a place where they were or are, uh, if there were tanks coming down my road, if there were you know, troops coming down my road, if I saw our clinic being bombed, um, because everything is so much closer and to think about you know, what, that's, what that's like. Um, and certainly seen war and uh, been in a place where a situation where you know, I, I thought that was my last day. Uh, the situation was such that, you know, I realized that I'm gonna die this day because of what was happening and the number of um, um, VC coming up the hill. You know, this is it. And I'm gonna go out, but I, I'm gonna do my job because my training was to protect, to fight, uh, to survive and to protect and then to heal. <laughs> So it was a real uh, a mix there. And um, so I, 
like in the, in the beginning, I have a lot of respect for the Ukrainian president uh, for standing his ground with his people. Don't see that here. We see uh, everyone, you know, away, you know, and now the troops are on the ground uh, doing the missions and so forth. So uh, to, to actually have someone, as we know, get in the trenches with you is huge. It's huge uh, to see them down there with you and understand what war is like. Uh, some people that are, you know, away that lead these things uh, have forgotten. And I think they all should come in and have a, have a piece of that. Uh, to remember or to experience it for the first time, um, they should be there. And I am certainly not for war. I, um, to think about the possibility, you know, of having to uh, pick up the tools of war to carry with me and carry out what I did do, um, literally makes me sick to my stomach that I would have to do that. Um, so, uh, and certainly looking at oneself as that was brought up is, is a huge piece too, as far as where we are with ourselves and our thoughts in, uh, in all of this and what, we're, what we hear ourselves saying, um, that um, we also have a, um, a kind of a, a connection, a tag or something that's connecting to that. So I, I, I listen and I try to open to what people are saying from, you know, from over there and here and uh, certainly looking for truth, which is difficult because of the layers. And, but what, you know, when you hear people speak, it's um, what people do it really uh, shows what they're, you know, what, what's going on there. So you hear what they say, but then what do they do? <laughs> so, so in my case, it's kind of like, you know, going through, uh, as we do various times, we go through the dark night of the soul. And we work through that. And it's not like we're necessarily be in depression or anything, but it, it, it's a place that we're working through. And as uh, Floyd said, he uh, meditates and becomes quiet. And for me, uh, uh, my visualization is it, it, even in war was that with all this going on, it's like a tornado, the chaos of the outside, but the center, the center is calm and it's strong and it holds. Um, so for me, that's a visualization uh, for me when things get that, that chaos and the uh, insanity, uh, uh, certainly chaos has its place. It changes, it transforms. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of pieces to that. Our own collective consciousness, our personal consciousness has a big piece in this and what we visualize out there. So that's a part of why is visualizing what I would like to see and send that out there. Um, and uh, while, um, you know, working, working on myself and supporting as best I can, uh, here, here at home, and certainly it's wanting to, to help the Ukrainians, uh, but it's tough to find out what is true as far as how you do that. Uh, and certainly my choice to do that actually would uh, uh, put some peace into whatever, the, whatever this whole thing is about. So I'm still thinking about that and trying to uh, hear about different possibilities, but uh, what we think, what we do is huge and then working on ourselves because we, you know, we, those different dynamics are, are out there and we're, you know, however small, we're a piece of that. So uh, it's a big piece. So it's kind of doing life <laughs> of ups and downs and so forth as we go along. So, but anyway, so it, that's all. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for your uh, input. Dave. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I thank uh, uh, everyone for participating. A couple of quick thoughts. Um, this, this whole thing felt like a train wreck from last month. I mean, I knew it was coming. I could feel it. I don't know how. I just knew that, that this was going to happen, and it's so sad. And, and, and as it was building and developing and the, and the attacks actually took place, 
I found myself for the first week or so, uh, I had great trouble sleeping. Uh, I was really out of kilter. And uh, uh, the, the, the other thought I have had was, I don't know quite how to frame this. Anyway, it's, it's like this whole thing is a big video game. In other words, we're seeing all these almost instantaneous reports of damage and, 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 and people fleeing and, and, and the back and the forth. And the thing that's worrying me as a veteran, knowing that there are so few veterans or so few people who have served recently in the military is I'm concerned that this whole thing is being perceived like, like somebody, some big video game. And you know you cheer for this side, and you, you, you you're against that side, and, and and of course that's not it, and and the tragedy and, and the real tragedy is going to be, uh, I I believe in flash prayers and I use them all the time, and I'm always playing, having flash prayers for uh, the peace in Ukraine and and but also remembering the Russian people, the terrible damage that's being inflicted on them, not militarily, but economically. Um, as a world, we got a lot of mess to clean up, and I don't know how we do that, um, but I know that uh, it's become a little easier to watch it until you see the next horrendous thing happen and being photographed. But the the instantaneousness of it is uh, amazing. Thank you. So, so I just want to throw something out there for you, Dave. Just a story when we when. Um, Desert Storm happened, higher headquarters wanted instantaneous feed. So what did they do? They didn't get it from typical intelligence. I was the one that had to install the three gun theater presentation so that they could watch CNN 24 seven. But it is, there's some, is truth to what you're saying. And it didn't happen as much as Vietnam because I remember as a kid every night my dad watched it and it was relatively new, but not what we have today, but what we have today is is in a way desensitizing many people because we see it all the time the video games my young um, son in law. You see it all the time and you're like, how can you just keep doing the same thing that and that's affecting us? And that's where I think we really have to look at um, um, this idea of playing the sacred fool where you don't tolerate either or and you just you help the people that were hurt by it. And I think what we got to do, we got to just stop this because what is it really motivated by is it motivated by money it's is it motivated by the fact that that putin wants to be a czar what is it really motivated? And, and i don't well i don't know that we can ever really find what the answer to that is and i think that's part of it too it's to recognize the truth is fluid but also what ultimately do we need in order to survive and we've got to think about this as surviving as a world, not as just one nation versus another nation or a group of people or NATO or the good versus the bad. Because in China, if you've talked to those Chinese folks, they think we're the bad people. So, Charlie, this may be a good po point to start wrapping it up. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> yes, I want to make sure that I give everybody, or we give everybody an opportunity to say what they would like to say. There's a couple more minutes here. If you'd like to, please, please contribute. Otherwise, um, you know, I just wanted to... Dave, on, on yours, you know, I felt completely helpless when I watched. I felt that anxiety. And I think I felt that like two months back. 
that there was something that was gravely happening. I was way down. I was feeling this sense of um, just uh, darkness and despair descending on me. And I was irritable and, and just in this dark place. And I think there was some part of me that was sensing this um, was coming. And then the helplessness of uh, watching this stuff unfold instantaneously has been has been difficult. Um, and the moments of, of where people, you know, have stood up against it uh, for me has been healing in the sense that I, if there, there's these little moments where there's this, the, the true spirit comes out. And because I had been so much a part of something that I didn't feel good about, you know, the evil that I was, contributing to um just seeing that people were willing to still fight for something that to keep something that they had was really healing for me on a in a, new, in a different way because i didn't i didn't get to live up to that ideal i didn't get to live up to that ideal watching them you know maybe it's just what's being said but that's the way it felt for me and so um I just really appreciate all of you being here today and, and hanging with us and, and, and being a part of this discussion. And this is, and moving through it in this space. And I really want us to just kind of close out um, with a meditation that is just very simple. It's, it's just entering your heart, right? It's just a, a quiet meditation. Um, and just to be able to sit back in your seat, wherever you're at, and just uh, allow yourself to relax into the moment and, and to close your eyes and start feeling the breath moving in through the nose, filling up your lungs and then exhaling all of the anxiety and tension and stress from the day, from this evening, from our conversations, letting it all out and allowing it to be absorbed and integrated by the great forces of life that are here to protect us and to guide us. So sink deeper and deeper into this quiet space, breathing in deep and then exhaling, breathing in deep and then exhale and allowing yourself to sink even deeper. And I want you to imagine in your mind's eye, as you're taking these long inhales, and long exhales, as you sink deeper and deeper, you sink deeper into your heart, deeper into your heart, go deep inside your heart. And then notice, as you sink deeper into your heart, you notice this beautiful garden you find in your garden all these birds that are singing. The air is fresh and clean. The hummingbirds are flying from flower to flower. It's this beautiful dance in the sky. And as you walk on this path of your garden and you explore it and see all the bursting of colors and flowers, they come to a flowing body of water and it's calming and it's soothing motion just relaxes you. And as you come to this body of water, you bend down to drink it. This clear, this pristine, rejuvenating water. And as you lift your head, you see this this bench, a temple, whatever it is for you, some place where you see in the distance that this river flows by and around it. And there's a bridge over this water. And you walk along the path until you come to the bridge. And, and then you, this temple is glowing, this beautiful white light. 
you cross over the bridge. This temple, this bench, this place is more magnificent than you have ever seen before. And this is in your heart. And in the very center, in the heart of this temple, you see this bright and burning flame. This eternal flame that's inside of your heart. You stand in awe and gratitude as you have reached the very center of your heart where the eternal flame lives. And then as you walk around, you notice someone that you have been wanting to speak to. That's just waiting there, someone that you have loved, that has moved on. And they beckon you to them and you can feel their love pouring from their eyes. And they have something to share with you that is just for you. Hear them. Hear what they have to say. You share your love for them. And they give you the comfort and tell you that says that all will be well. All that you're going through, all will be well. You embrace them. You sit with them. And now in this moment of feeling that safe and loved and cared for, let us sit in silence in this space in your heart Five long, slow, deep breaths. On your last breath, embrace this person who lives in your heart. Gently walk out of your temple off the bench across the bridge, walking through your garden that is always there inside of you. And then start to gently rise back up from your heart up and into the room where you are at, into your environment, into your space. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes. Folks, we have uh, just one couple quick announcements. We have a um, Memorial Day uh, event that we're going to be doing on Memorial Day that we would all love for everyone here to join us. It's going to be uh, Dr. Uh, Edward Tick, myself, and Chuck, who are going to be leading it and going through. So please sign up over on the Rose Center. Uh, if there's a link, Chuck, I don't know if you know where the link is to it. And oh, you can put that yes. In the chat section, that would be great. We will be going through um, our online memorial uh, weekend service. Uh, it should be uh, very filled with song and, and uh, memorial of, of those who have uh, fallen. And, and uh, so please sign up for it. You can go to the Rose Center as well. Uh, and look for it. It is one of their um, uh, items that will be coming up in May. Our next uh, gathering of warriors is going to be next month, uh, April, the last Tuesday of the month. We're going to be going back into talking and finishing up the idea of the betrayal bonds and the archetypes that manage them. We've spoken a lot about it. We're going to dive more into specifics and the things that we can do to 
to heal those archetypal energetic wounds inside ourselves so that we can, as warriors, have healthy relationships uh, with our loved ones. So um, thank you for being here. Chuck, do you have anything else you want to say before I close? Yeah, I put the link in to, to the Rose Center in um, chat. Um, so it is there. Um, and then, yes, come for the one in April, the one in May, we'll be talking about a new model around moral injury and the intersection between the person, the organization, and um, the situation that caused the moral injury being wrapped around by your mm -hmm. community. Yeah, and so it will be a really good way to understand moral injury from a non mental health perspective. This mm -hmm. comes from more of a spiritual place. Um, please come the it's going to be the last Tuesday in May, which when I learn how to use my phone. Um, right now is scheduled for the 31st of May. And I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. We appreciate you being here. Um, both Charlie and I are honored with your presence. Yes. So very honored. I want to close off the space um, really quick with just a blessing, if you don't mind, um, from the Buddha. May every creature abound in well-being and peace. May every living being, weak or strong, the long and the small, the short and the medium sized, the mean and the great. May every living being, seen or unseen, those dwelling far off, those nearby, those already born, those waiting to be born, may all attain inward peace. Let no one deceive another. Let no one despise another in any situation let no one, from antipathy or hatred, wish evil to anyone at all. Just as a mother with her own life protects her only son from hurt, so within yourself foster a limitless concern for every living creature. Display a heart of boundless love for all the world in all its height and depth and broad extent. Love unrestrained, without hate or enmity. Then as you stand or walk, sit or lie, until overcome by drowsiness, devote your mind entirely to this. It is known as living here, life divine. The Buddha. Thank you, folks, for being here on such an important night. It's a blessing to know all of you. Thank you.